Um, hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker for this workshop, Ken Goldberg. So Ken is the William S. Foy Distinguished Chair in Engineering at UC Berkeley and an award-winning roboticist, filmmaker, artist, popular public speaker on AI and robotics. Ken trained the next generation of researchers and entrepreneurs in his research lab at UC Berkeley. He published over 300 papers, three books, and holds nine US patents. His artwork has been featured in 70 art exhibits, including the 2000 Whitney Biennial. He's a pioneer in technology and artistic visual expression, bridging the two cultures of art and science with unique skills in communication and creative problem solving, invention, and thinking on the edge. Ken has presented over 600 invited lectures at events around the world, including this one here. And I can, I'm very happy and honored that I got to be one of his, PhD, one of his many PhD students during my uh, PhD study. So uh, please let take it away for you. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate that, Daniel. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I, I have, um, I, I want to. This this topic is something that my group and I have been thinking about for, for the last five years. We're really interested in it, and I'm so glad that this workshop is having an excellent new iteration. So we've been thinking about this in three components. One is one-dimensional deformable objects like strings and cables. Two-dimensional deformable objects like fabrics and garments and three-dimensional deformable objects like solids and bags. Now, um, I just want to briefly acknowledge that this is my, my, my group. It's uh, that all this work is really credited to, to them. They deserve the credit. And uh, here's a little cartoon of our lab with some of our actual robots in it. More information is on automation.berkeley.edu. So what I want to talk about today is, um, is something that we're just, we've been exploring in uh, just this past year and will be presented at, uh, at the conference. Um, and what we're particularly looking at is, a, is an approach to, to deformable manipulation that we're calling real to sim to real. So I'm gonna go back um, a little bit in time and start with some earlier work and then come up to that. I'm also going to talk a little bit about this idea of labels from um, ultraviolet light, which we're very excited about. And I think is relevant to most all the work that's going on in, uh, in, that, that I've been hearing about in the, in the workshop so far. I'm very excited about it. And this is a general technique, and I want to make sure I have time for that at the end. OK, so going from the beginning, the, our first foray into deformable objects was uh, learning how to manipulate cables in dynamically to do things like this. Hold on. Sorry? Oh, I thought I heard something. So this was inspired a bit by um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, TV or movie series and how uh, you can manipulate something like a, a bullwhip. And so we wanted to see if we could get a robot to be able to do something analogous. And um, here's the idea. So we have a fixed, the, the actually was inspired a bit by vacuuming in the lab. And we were trying to get the cable uh, loose. It was snagged over a chair. So you know how we do, you do this? You kind of fling the, fling it, and it goes over the chair. So that's the idea here. And we looked around for related work. There is some interesting, very interesting work in, uh, in manipulating um, uh, uh, flexible objects like cables, and also, of course, uh, uh, throwing um, objects, tossing by. And uh, we considered here three tasks. We looked at vaulting, which is just to go over an obstacle, uh, knocking, which is to knock something off of an obstacle, and the third one is weaving, to weave uh, the cable in and out of different obstacles. And the assumption is, again, that the uh, one end of the cable is fixed, so it's plugged into a wall, for example. And we also wanted this to be, we wanted a method that would be general, that we could generalize to different cable types. So we looked at these these ones. Um, the idea, and this is this was reported in the paper last year, is uh, there's an algorithm. Uh, first, something that we call INDI, which is um, a acronym for Iterative Training 
for dynamic cable manipulator manipulation, and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. And then GOP, which is a method for optimizing the motion trajectory of the arm to uh, to minimize jerk. So the parameter learning here was based in this case for learning a single uh, key point for the ballistic trajectory of the arm. So we wanted to learn the apex point where the arm should the midpoint of it should uh, should pass through that would cause the cable to, to do what we want. So the again the assumption is that the endpoint is fixed and that we also are holding on to the um, to the cable with the gripper. One key part of this was being able to do resets. And I think this is an interesting question in general for this, for this in, in terms of deformable objects is how do we, how can we reliably reset things? It's very, it's very difficult in general, but with cables, we found that we actually could do that. And the idea was to essentially pull the cable fully taut and then drop it, drape it down onto the ground. And if you see here on the right, this is actually an overlay of um, 20 different cable iterations after the um, after the reset. You can see you can almost not tell the difference. So the reset was very effective in this in this case. Again, for one dimensional cable, it's not too hard. But thinking about that is very helpful because you want to be able to get back to an initial state so that you can continue, you can do exploration. The um, the pipeline for learning this was that we we did a with deep network, a ResNet to essentially learn these three, um, the, the, the configuration of the apex point. Um, and then ran, once we had that, we ran it through the trajectory solver, the GOM solver, for, to be able to compute the time optimal trajectory for the arm that would minimize the jerk. And then we execute that. So here's the vaulting trajectory in real time. Uh, here's the knocking trajectory, um, a success. And then here's a, a weaving trajectory. Good. Now, it doesn't always work, and I'm sorry I don't have bloopers, I try to always show those, but um, it doesn't always work, and there's some, there's some variability, but it worked actually surprisingly uh, a large uh, fraction of the time. And it's fairly repeatable, again, if you can do the reset to get you to the same initial state starting point, then the, the motion is fairly deterministic. I mean, repeatable. Now, in contrast, here's a problem where the motion is extremely non repeatable. And this is a problem that we started studying uh, this year that we call uh, planar robot casting. And uh, this is work with, by, um, by Raven and Vincent and, um, and Lawrence who are here and they'll be presenting this. The, um, here's the idea is that um, we, there's many scenarios where you want to be able to control the motion of, of an object um, but you, but you can essentially only launch the object, and then you don't have control in, if, after that. So in in cases like this where there's friction, uh, the shuffleboard or bowling or anything like that, then you have to. The, the problem is very is very difficult to model, and there is essentially this fundamental sin to real gap. So the and this is what we've been talking about today in several of the, the presentations, the sim to real gap, because we can simulate these things in a somewhat realistic manner. They look good, but they're not, um, they're, they, they don't then translate into physical reality. So how can we get around that? So there's one technique is domain randomization. As everyone knows, you, you, you insert some noise into the simulator and the training and then try it. That, that can be helpful in many cases. Um, domain adaptation is another way of doing this where there's a, some interleaving between the sim and, uh, and, the, and the real rollouts. Um, but the idea that we're particularly um, have been thinking about is this, where we essentially train the simulator, try to learn the parameters for the simulator to match the physical system that we're working with. So we collect some real rollouts, then train the simulator, and then use the simulator to generate lots of training examples, and then learn a policy. So this is the, the real to sim part. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh, this is just system identification. It's well known, it's a solved problem. You can just go to a textbook. Well, yes, if you're talking about a lumped parameter system like a robot arm, where all you're trying to do is identify the masses then it is possible to excite the system in a, in a very specific way to learn what the, the masses might be or the link lengths. But in a general system like this, where you don't have a good model, then it's actually extremely difficult to identify what are the system parameters for the simulator. 
because you have things like torsional variables and friction and um, static and dynamic friction, very hard to, um, to estimate what those should be. So in this case, you're seeing that we actually, in this particular instance, are able to match fairly reasonably. And the technique that we're using is, uh, is differential evolution. So this is a technique that's, that was developed in, in, in other domains for tuning simulators. And so what we do is we start by collecting a fairly small amount of data of examples of just pulling on the, um, on the cable, um, basically casting. And then we try to look at those, those trajectories and run them through the simulator and, and then tweak the simulator uh, essentially until it hopefully converges. Now this, this was interesting and surprising to us. We tried a number of different methods, but this one, differential evolution worked surprisingly well uh, in this case. And then we were able to generate, um, once we have the simulator tuned up, we can generate lots and lots of examples, like 40 times more examples. Then we use that to do policy training. And the, um, oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the policy training. So here we're comparing some different methods. The first is cast and pull. And I should mention that one way you might say that we can achieve this or solve this problem is just to essentially cast as far out as possible in the direction of the desired target and then pull it back to the target. Um, but this doesn't work very well. The, the, the median error, and this is as a function of the length of the cable, is fairly large at 61%. Um, Gaussian process model does better, but the policy is trained with this real to real real um, here is does, does better. So this is if we use only the real data, we get to about 15% error. And then if we use the simulated data only, we get to, um, we get a little bit better. But if we combine the two, the real data and the simulated data together, we get the best performance that we're able to achieve. And we believe that there's a certain amount of aleatory uncertainty that remains. In other words, there's a certain amount of, of, of error that is gonna be inevitable just due to the nature of this problem and the frictional interactions, which are very difficult to control or model. We also try this with different cables. So here's the first one. Um, and it's a fairly thin cable. This is the second one where the cable is a little bit thicker and we get uh, a little bit worse performance. And then this is the third one with the thickest cable. And uh, again, the performance degrades a little bit there as well. All right, now here's an example of, this is a successful target. <laughs> uh, Simeon is, very, is, uh, is acknowledging the success here. Um, and so the idea being that we have a camera overhead, we toss a coin, into the in workspace and then we have the robot try to hit that trajectory. By the way, the one thing that's also very nice about this domain is that you can do unsupervised uh, data collection. The robot can just be left alone and you have a camera overhead just tracking the motions. Just for fair, this is the blooper, I promise you, that's, a, that's showing it doesn't always work. All right, so we, this is, I, I do not want to claim in any way that we can do this perfectly anytime soon. We can characterize a lot of the error, again, because the nice thing about the unsupervised data collection, we can model and characterize the error for many different targets. And by the way, the one thing to note is that the uh, bold area in the inner circle is the reachable workspace of the arm, and then the, the outer uh, um, uh, annulus is the uh, is, is points that are outside the reachable workspace. So that's where casting is particularly nice. So this is with the different cables and we can characterize um, where the errors uh, form. And we, 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 we see that there are certain target areas, like certain on the fringe, uh, on the periphery, that are more difficult to, to um, control than on the center. All right, now I'm gonna switch over to fabric and smoothing. And this, this work um, goes back a number of years. And I wanna also acknowledge Daniel did our initial work in this area. This is um, also with uh, uh, Soshi and Navid uh, and Katsu at, uh, who were at Honda. And um, the idea here is to, to, to we, we started with the goal of uh, bed making. We wanted to, uh, to be able to, to, to make beds. And so, but we, we started exploring this in the context of using our Da Vinci robot, surgical robot, to do um, fabric manipulation. And the goal here, the very first goal is to just maximize the coverage. So again, remember we were trying to make a bed, but in actually many other applications like folding, you want to first of all lay things out as, as smoothly as possible, which is to essentially maximize the coverage of a crumpled 
uh, piece of fabric. So um, Daniel very, um, very uh, heroically developed a, a fabric simulator on his own uh, using a spring and uh, mass uh, uh, model here. And I'll show you a little picture of uh, the performance. This is a finite element model. Let me see here. Here we go. That Daniel um, uh, developed and, and put out open source with a 25 by 25 grid. And you can see that actually you get a fairly realistic um, appearance of the, of the fabric. But there's, what that also taught us, there's so many interesting parameters, it's nuances. It, even in terms of how many uh, grid points you should use, um, how you deal with self collisions, um, how, how many iterations do you do with the integration? I mean, there's a lot of parameters. It's very difficult to do this. Um, and uh, this was actually fairly reasonable. I would have to say, I, I think it was very useful for us for, as an initial start. Um, and, and Daniel used that to, to develop an algorithmic supervisor that would know where the state of the fabric was and then provide uh, points. Basically, the, two, the key idea here is to find the key point to pick the fabric and then a direction to pull the fabric to achieve higher uh, coverage, to increase the coverage. And so um, we ran these experiments um, with a dagger using demonstrations, using a, a small number of, of demonstrations from an algorithmic supervisor, essentially, um, where we knew, we, we had basically uh, inserted the demonstration of where we, the pick point and pull direction should be. And then we compared it to some other baselines, like just uh, pulling in the orthogonal direction to wrinkles that we could detect, or um, pulling a, to reduce the highest point of the fabric. And, um, and the, the, the dagger uh, model did better than those two baselines. The next thing we tried was something called visual foresight uh, that was, uh, this was done by Ryan Hawk in the lab. This was, um, the idea here was to actually model the, 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 the effect of different actions and then try to predict the effect of, let's say, multiple actions out, what would be the state of the, of the fabric and try and basically choose a sequence of actions that would get us closer to the desired final state. In other words, maximizing coverage in this case. And um, we, the, the nice thing here is that you can just take random motions, random uh, pull operations on a piece of fabric to essentially learn it. What it's basically trying to predict is what will happen when you apply an action to a crumpled fabric, piece of fabric. And the predictions actually were, we learned to be able to do that fairly well. Again, this is all in SIM. And, the, um, and then once you have that predictor, you can essentially use it in a optimization loop to find the sequence of actions that will get you closer to um, the, the final state. So this is the, uh, as I mentioned in the earlier talk, uh, model predictive control, we applied it here, where we have, um, we are constantly updating and relearning a, a uh, sorry, reapplying the learned uh, uh, predictor to, um, to determine what should be the next action. And this, and there are three tiers of difficulty here. Again, this is something I think we could also discuss as a group that, um, that there are many cases for, for deformable objects. And so we, we found it was helpful to divide into sort of a, a tier one, fairly easy, tier two, which is more complicated, and tier three, which is very difficult. Okay, so I'm rushing through all these because I want to get, get through this, but I'm looking forward to discussion on, on all these points later today. Um, another aspect that I want to mention that, that um, Ryan used that was, has been effective for us is using depth sensing uh, for fabric. Because uh, with, uh, as everyone knows, works with fabric, it's very difficult to, to determine state from the um, uh, 2D images, from RGB images. But we had a depth sensor, and that gives us another signal, another channel that, uh, that can be very helpful. The other, the, 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 the next thing we tried with fabric was um, learning key points. And this is Adi uh, Ganapathy's work, he, we, the, and along with a number of others. He, um, the idea here is to learn key points in fabric from, again, many examples, and we'll, we'll come back to this. But then once we have that, once we, we identify key points, then the idea is we can show one folding demonstration on a canonical example with, with a garment, and then apply that to new garments, subsequent garments in different configurations, because it just wants to find the associated key point and then do the associated folding moves. 
So again, here's a demonstration action. If you look at the upper left, is to grab um, at the at the, uh, at the sleeve and move that fabric, fold that across the uh, the center line. And then the nice thing is, once you learn that, then you can apply that from different for different fabric, different garments, in different orientations, as you can see there. And the same would work for um, for pieces of uh, square fabric. And the okay, so now I'm going to move on to fabric flinging. How much time do I? Have? Much as you need. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. No, I'll, I'll end on time here. Um, Flingbot. So hopefully everyone knows uh, this this terrific work uh, by Ha San. This is a real beautiful uh, piece of uh, research where they they realized that with by by grasping two corners of a piece of fabric and then lofting the um, the motion up with two arm, the fabric up with two robot arms, essentially a, 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 a new primitive that they call flinging. And this is very effective for doing smoothing. And it's actually also very, very much of a, um, you know, inspired, I think, by human motions. When we're folding laundry or things, we do this as well, um, using essentially the air as a as, as sort of a, an extra manipulator. Um, so, the, uh, they, they published a beautiful work, on, a beautiful paper on this that was in uh, Coral last year. And uh, I remember one of the discussions came up and the questions afterward was, well, do you really need two arms? And uh, so there's a debate about that that sort of came up. And, and someone who was in the audience said, well, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I had a baby and I had learned how to flame, how to fold laundry with one arm. I had to because I had the baby in the other arm. So then we started thinking, well, could we, could we learn how to do this with a robot? And so uh, that's, the, uh, that's the origin of the learning to flame with the single arm paper that uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Chen and Raven Wong uh, worked on. And um, so I'm, I'm not gonna have time to go, to go into full detail on this. There's, um, there's, a, there's a fair amount of prior work on, uh, on, on trying to do RL for this problem. But we wanted to, to look at it from this perspective of training just a single trajectory motion, the fling, if you will. And so we were able to break this down into a seven parameter trajectory. This is on the side view looking at the, of the robot arm. This, um, this motion here is parameterized by some key points and velocities. And um, so then the trick was to uh, try and apply to learn combinations of these uh, of these parameters, so each one of those is a fling uh, motion, and then you apply the uh, multi-arm bandit approach. So each one of those fling motions is a bandit, if you will, and then you're applying it. And each time you do that, you get a payoff, which is the amount of coverage that the the, the garment achieves. So we looked at a, a range of garments like these, as you can see here, um, and. The idea is that um, this is this are the results of after after learning the best bandit motion. Now again, this is a case like the like the planar robot casting where there's quite a bit of non-determinism or aleatory uncertainty. So you'll never going to be able to do this um, perfectly. But the idea is, can we find motions, flame motions that will increase, will do better um, on average than um, others in terms of uh, coverage, final coverage. You see that these, these actually do fairly deep reasonably. We actually had a, a little competition in the lab, and humans were somewhere anywhere from the humans, at least the grad students in the lab, were anywhere from like 78 to, to 88 or so um, in, uh, in being able to achieve coverage. So it's a hard problem. Um, there's a, there's a, the, the details on the paper um, here are actually under submission. Um, for for ISRR, but the, we we can use a cross entropy method and a combination of that plus Bayesian optimization to further tune. And here's just a, a vid, visual of this uh, motion. So the idea is to first pick it up and then shake it here to to basically shake out wrinkles, and then uh, a little more shaking to shake out wrinkles, and then um, here's the flame motion. To drop it down onto the uh, onto the surface. I'll just show you one more of those real quick. This is a so this is a reset, if you will, right? So the again, this is self-supervised. There's a camera overhead and in front, and it's trying to um, maximize coverage. All right. The 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 last um, result I'll, I'll mention is uh, 
another paper under review right now, which is uh, learning to fold garments with one arm. Um, this is uh, this was an interesting experiment because we used a robot setup that we did not have access to. This robot was entirely in a Google re uh, warehouse, and Google gave us access to controlling the arm, but we never got to even see it. Um, so this is a good example of research that can be done during COVID. 19, right? You don't have you don't have to go get access to a remote environment, but you can um, perform experiments uh, repeatedly. And uh, so I won't say more about this because it's still under review. But this is uh, if you you can find uh, Brian if you want to learn more about it. It's a very exciting idea that you can do these experiments without uh, being there and present. All right. So the last thing I want to mention is this idea of uh, learning labels uh, or key points in a very efficient way. And um, the, this is a joint work with Brigitte and Justin who are um, in the lab. And they, they have the hymn book the title, All You Need Is Love. So love is, in this case, labels from ultraviolet. And um, the clever idea here is to um, essentially, well, let me say what, the, what we're trying to do is to be able to segment or uh, identify key points on, in this case, could be rigid objects, but primarily on deformable objects where it's very difficult to, uh, to achieve, to, to, to obtain labeled examples. So um, you can either do this in simulation, as we've heard this morning, one way is to simulate the materials where you have ground truth, you know where things are, and then you can generate images, realistic images of, the, of these, and then you try and essentially train it um, with a lot of these examples. In other words, the, the labels are the, here indicated in red on the left, um, on the, the other option is to take real images from the real world and then label them with humans, humans uh, labeling every object in the scene. And that's obviously extremely time consuming. Um, so here's the new idea. Um, labeling them with ultraviolet is just simply to paint the material and with an ultraviolet dye in such a way that you can uh, turn the, with, with Standard lighting, you don't see the dye at all, it's invisible. And then when you turn on the ultraviolet, you, the dye jumps out and you have very clear, essentially, you see where these uh, key points are and then those provide your labels. So as you see here, the yellow, the, the yellow plot execution, sorry, I should say, once you've done the training with all these examples, then you don't need the dye at all and you don't need the ultraviolet light at all. You just then, from that point on, you hopefully have learned how to find these key points in raw images. So the idea here is to, again, combine the, the, the ultraviolet paint with the ultraviolet lighting to come up with these pairs of, of images in, in real, if you will, and then images that are labeled. And um, they went out and found out that there's a lot of different kinds of uh, paints, ultraviolet paints out there. Some of them are visible in real light, so they that's actually not so good because then you they, 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 they mess up your ability. You don't want to use paint in, in the subsequent operations. So you want something that's transparent to normal light, invisible in normal light, but, but very highly visible in ultraviolet light. So again, so what you see here is the standard image on the left of a piece of fabric. And on the right, when you turn the UV on, you see that the corners jump out. Similarly, another thing that's hard is, is, is a piece of uh, cable or rope. Uh, very hard to track, as we all know, we're tr trying to do that. But in, when you turn the ultraviolet on, it pops out. And it's very easy to identify in the, in the image on the right. And the last one is we're trying to find needles uh, in surgery, surgical applications, which is very difficult. So again, by actually activating the ultraviolet, we're able to do so. What's, um, what you're seeing on the right hand here is that the UV labels, which are very easy to extract just by color threshold, they, are very, very high quality, so they compare very well with what humans would do. Um, and as you're going to see, sometimes even better than humans, because humans are prone to error. So again, here on the left, you see something, and then that's how it looks. This, this is actually after the training. Now it's labeled the images, because it's learned how to do that. Um, so in this, in the lower, so it's remarkably good at finding corners in this case. Here's a case where, again, after training, we're, again, in this case, we're not using any UV. I know the coloring looks a little bit like, like it's UV, but there's no UV paint or light at all anymore. We just now take an image like you see on the left, and that's what pops out on the right. So the, the network is very, very good at learning this after it's seen sufficient number of examples. 
And then here's the case of the uh, the uh, for the needles. As you can see, the needle is very hard to see on the left images, but that's what pops out on the right out of the network, not out of the UV. All right, so I want to say this is um, very exciting. It's more accurate than humans because in some of these cases, as you can see here in the far right, it's not at all clear where to label the corners on that little blob of fabric, right? But the UV shows it very clearly. And it's much faster than human labor. So um, when we try to basically just do a, a, a sample of these, it's like 2,500 times faster. So you can just, and then again, unsupervised manner, you can just have the robot just moving things around and you can turn the light on and off, turn on and off, get these pairs, generate thousands of pairs, and then use that to train your, um, your system. So we're very excited about this work. Um, you can ask us about it, or it's linked on our web lab webpage. But um, the nice thing is we, we provide, we're happy to provide all the code if you need it, and the information about what dyes and what lights we use. The whole thing costs like $200, so it's very easy to recreate. So we're really happy to share that with others. <coughs> And pretty excited about it for exactly this domain of uh, of manipulating deformable objects. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you. So, um, does anyone have any question? Then the microphone should be working. So, if you can just walk up to the microphone and ask the question, it'll be easy for everyone to hear. Uh, okay. So. Uh, yeah, so if you have questions, just line up on the microphone. You need to get very close to it. Oh, yeah. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question on all the fabric cleaning projects. Um, so obviously, the um, actually, like the type and the mass of the cloth uh, will affect the uh, type of motion that you need. Uh, I wonder uh, if the current system can handle it or like if there's a way of generalizing to different patterns. Thank you. Okay, great. So, excellent question. So, the, 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 the type and the, the, the material and the weight of the fabric is going to affect on the flinging motion, affect the, affect the, 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 the flinging motion that would be more successful than others. And you're absolutely right. So, one thing I will say is that this, this method is meant to essentially quickly learn a new, a new garment. So you'll give it a garment, it'll start experimenting, and then it's going to learn a trajectory for that garment. Now, the, on, in terms of the trying to generalize to reduce the number of samples that are needed for the new garment, right? You want to be able to learn, because you've learned a bunch of garments in the past, here's a new garment, maybe you can categorize it, right? It's in the same, it's a, a t-shirt, right? And it has similarities. So can you use that to bootstrap the learning? And it's a great question. We have done limited work on, on being able to generalize in that way. The um, one thing that we, and this is something we should, we, 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 have, we do plan to do. One of the things that I think is, is really important that we're starting to understand is that um, more recently that the fabrics that are, are, are very heavy and um, don't basically, um, that defeat the air current, right, is require a very different kind of treatment. And it's actually very hard to get high coverage from that. Um, there's the, let's see, actually, uh, Lawrence, are you here? Lawrence is in the back. Lawrence, do you want to answer that question? Okay, that's a better answer than what I was trying to get. But it, so you say that you classify it, then you have those set of actions and use those for the bandit method. And so you have a starting set of priors that are that are actually hopefully will be better than average than, than if you started at scratch. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Lawrence, you might want to, everybody who's involved in this might want to be ready for, for the answer to these questions. Yes. I guess the only grail for the formables in the LUV constant context would be to label them density. Do you think there is a chance that it could be done? Um, so sorry, you, Professor Goldberg, could you repeat the question? Okay, the only grail in, um, in the UV uh, ultraviolet uh, labeling would be to get a dense labeling of the, all, the whole state of the... Uh, yeah, for the formables. 
Yes, that's tricky. Well, I mean, I guess that's somewhat true with the with the cable, right? That's a dense model, right? You can't take, track the whole piece of the cable. I'm a little worried that if you painted the whole uh, fabric piece, for example, then you wouldn't, you actually, I'm not sure that the holy grail is to be able to um, just find all of the fabric, because that's not that hard. But what you want to do is find key points. Like, um, let's say we wanted to find um, wrinkles, right? But that's hard because the wrinkle then would have to, you, you, you know, that would be hard to paint that appropriately, right? Because the wrinkle would be um, created on the fly. But key points like corners, or if you're doing folding of garments, you might label things like uh, buttons and, uh, and corners of uh, or sort of features on the fabric. Um, that could be, you could do that very easily with the UV. So it's a good question, though, if you want to get a fully dense, um, dense, model, then sample, and I don't know, I mean, obviously the Pete Florence uh, technique of learning uh, dense object descriptors might be useful there. I just don't know how that would work with ultraviolet, but maybe there's a way to do that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Actually, uh, I want to make sure that we get at least one of the Zoom um, questions, just because this is really a hybrid workshop, so may I just ask one question from Zoom? Okay. It's um, from Jihong Zhu and says, um, you know, great work. I was wondering in the real to sim to real work, in real to sim, how much data do you need to train a simulator? And if the data is able to generate a model reasonably well, can you design a controller based on that model? And so if so, what additional benefit do the does the sim to real bring to the task? Good. Okay, Lawrence, come back. Come on up here for a second, all right? Raven, Lawrence, all right, because um, they're asking about how much data is needed. So in, in particular, we found that if we just used the amount of real data that we, we, we collected, um, we're able to, um, do you guys have the numbers offhand? The, go ahead, Lawrence. 25 real projectors for the simulator. 25 real trajectories for tuning the simulator. But if we just use those 25 trajectories to learn a policy, that was not sufficient. The quality was, was much poorer than if we were able to tune the simulator, then generate simulated examples, and then use the combination of the real and the simulated uh, uh, demonstrations to tune the policy. Good. All right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for presenting your great job. Uh, and also, uh, I have a question about labeling from UV light. Yes. So why uh, you use UV light, for example, for uh, object detection of cable? Why not use it for the color, color of the cable, and then use it use it as labeling? Oh, okay, good. So a lot of times, so it's asking why not just paint the cable. Right, and right. in fact, or the needle, right, which is what. Um, so, in fact, the, 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 the I'm sorry to make that more clear. In practice, after the learning, we want to be able to do this under situations where the cable um, or the rope or the needle are not painted, right? So, because that's very common in, in real scenarios, right? You don't want to, you often don't get the luxury of a very high contrast material that can pop out. So that's why you're doing this. So the needles, for example, you can't paint surgical needles. You have to just take them for, because that will, that will make them un, inoperable for, you couldn't use them on humans, right? You, you have to leave them in their natural state, which has a lot of specularities curved, right, because of the metallic um, material. So the same is true for, for cables too, because you may get cables that, um, like surgical thread, you want to be able to track that, but it's going to be in a color that's very hard to distinguish from the background. Okay, so what we do is we essentially get what you're asking to say, we get that high color contrast when we're training, that comes, that's what we get from the, um, from turning on and off the UV, but then we don't, we hope the idea is to, to move away from that. So then you don't have it, you don't rely on that color contrast anymore once you've trained the network. That's the, the key insight. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I understand that you, you are saying if we, depend on using color as we want to use it, then maybe we, we are not able to paint it, for example. But what, what I'm saying, uh, during the training, why not using the, the painting, and then use the... Oh, wait, using, let, let's take this offline, because I think you're misunderstanding oh, sure, the sure. idea. Yeah. It's that we, we use the coloring only to train, and then you take the coloring away. Yes. So you don't need the coloring to, to do the perception. Exactly, yeah. 
Right. So let's talk right afterward. Okay. I, thank you. And also, uh, there's a there's a number of people waiting behind you. Yeah, second question: How how large was your training set? That's it. Like, training. How long was it? For laboring using your like, Yeah. Oh, the training set. Let's see, guys, are you here? Where are they? All right, we will answer that question offline. Um, I don't so have the numbers. Maybe just one more question, just because we're we're going a little over time, but maybe the last question. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for the great talk. Um, just a quick question on uh, fabrics moving. What does the distribution of piggy points look like? Is it just mostly the corners, or what happens if you limit it to just the corners in like the general case? Daniel, you can answer that one. Okay. So the question is. In the in, in the fabric smoothing, what if you just label you limit yourself to picking only at corners? How does that does that help you? Yeah. Uh, so in general, because when we're doing something like um, say learning from demonstrations or learning from some expert policy, because in cloth smoothing and folding, manipulating the key points like corner is fundamental to the task. Like if you just do that, like that seems to be the most reliable way. So it it makes sense to, for example, make sure that the demonstrator does like manipulation on corners, or if you're trying to learn from a long, a large offline data set, maybe bias the data collection towards those key points. Like that's one of the like the problem specific assumptions that you can make to get further gains instead of like taking an off the shelf method and without any modification. Uh, that, that's my take on, on this. Great.